Welcome to the Connectfulness Practice Podcast. Here, we settle into the murky, tangled, and freaking hard parts of life to restore our relationship with the self so it can ripple out to the people we love, the work we do, and the world around us. If we can't fix what's wrong, then our grandchildren inherit it. In order to fix what's wrong, we have to talk about it. And we can't move that conversation forward if we're not willing to be real about where we are now. We have to push on the edge of what it means to connect. Otherwise, nothing will ever change. I'm your host, Rebecca Wong. I'm here to guide you through a series of radically honest conversations about what it means to be truly human in all of its messy, beautiful, hilarious, and heartbreaking glory. In our collective effort of looking inward, we're starting to do the outward work of reconnecting the world. While these discussions will guide you into the connectfulness practice, this podcast is not meant to be a substitute for the depth of work that you'd encounter with a licensed provider. If something in this episode touches you, reach out. That's where you initiate the ripple that restores relationships. You can learn more about my connectfulness counseling practice and our collective for therapists in private practice at connectfulness.com. This episode is brought to you by Therapy Notes. Therapy Notes is a simple, secure EHR platform for therapists and private practice. It keeps you organized and creates a container for all the details that run your practice so that you can focus on what really matters. Use the promo code CONNECTFULNESS and get two months free when you sign up at therapynotes.com. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Rebecca Jorgensen, or Becca. Becca is certified by the International Center for Excellence in EFT, that's Emotionally Focused Therapy, as a therapist, a supervisor of therapists, and a trainer. She trains therapists and psychologists nationally and internationally. She co-presents with Dr. Sue Johnson, the originator and developer of Emotionally Focused Therapy and the Hold Me Tight Relationship Enhancement Program. Becca is also the co-creator of the Building a Lasting Connection Premarital and Newlywed Education Program and Connection System, and she regularly works with couples who want to heal affairs, sexual addiction, couple distress, and childhood trauma. You know, there's so many things that we're going to cover in today's conversation, but among them, um, this is really a conversation about how to cultivate safe, sacred spaces that allow us to see how it is that our own insecurities cultivate these um, autopilot disconnections and how the different ways that we've learned over over our lifetimes of coping actually can increase the pain and the loneliness that we experience, further disconnecting us from the security that we're seeking in our relationships. And for me, one of the the things that I find so interesting is that um, we're all afraid of something. We're all catastrophically afraid of being alone. And the antidote to that loneliness is connection. And so in this episode, we're really talking about how to get out of our own way and get back to the we instead of staying focused on the places where we're feeling lost and alone and lonely. I hope you enjoy this episode. So today I'm here with Dr. Rebecca Jorgensen, also known as Becca. And we're going to be talking about some common relationship pitfalls. Hi, Becca. Hi. Hi. It's so great to be here with you and to share this space around helping relationships. I know. This is definitely one of your favorite things to talk about, isn't it? It's definitely one of my very favorite things. Things that keeps me um, moving in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we can just start by talking about how how it came to be that this is one of your your specialties, because you have so many different ways that you help with this from training therapists to supervising therapists and working with couples. So I just would love to know how you came to be where you are right now. Well, I was a very poor couple therapist. (laughs) And then I got a a couple therapy training. Actually, I had done couple therapy training, but not emotionally focused couple therapy training. And I read Sue Johnson's book and thought I was doing couple therapy by the EFT book. And then I, I got the opportunity to go to Canada and to take what was then a five-day training with Sue. 
And as I left that parking lot, I thought, I think I'm the only one in my state, maybe in all the states around me that's even heard of Sue Johnson. It was long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I need to, I need to get this out to my colleagues and people that I know and the couples that are struggling because this makes this changes. It makes everything. sense. Yeah. 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 And so- it indeed has changed everything for me. <laughs> what do you think is one of the biggest messages in terms of what you've learned and what you bring to the um, both your personal life, your professional life, to the couples that you work with? What's one of the biggest lessons that you have taken away from the work that you do? Well, when we are insecurely attached, we have difficulties, not only relationally, but just with emotion, with our own emotion regulation, and which then makes relationships more difficult. And the more, and it just creates this kind of swirl of hardness, you know, difficulty in life. And both, it doesn't matter what kind of relationship. So understanding both how that attachment system works inside Mm -hmm. of our own being, as well as then what we can connect with others around and with um, makes a huge amount of difference. So for our listeners that are listening to us um, right now, and maybe this is a kind of new concept for them, or Mm. they've heard about attachment and attachment theory, um, attachment parenting, they've heard about all these different kinds of ways that we throw around this word attachment, but maybe, you know, it doesn't sink in yet about Mm. in a really embodied way about what secure attachment looks or feels like. How would you help to describe that? Well, secure attachment is, we could call it um, like the, the science of love <laughs> rather than attachment. So yeah. it's how do we really um, create and maintain um, a security inside of ourselves that helps us have loving, very loving relationships and helps us recognize when we hit spots that are painful maybe from our histories or from things that we've got hurt in relationships by and the way that we then armor up or defend ourselves um, to try to have that pain be recognized or to try to not have that pain block our relationships. So it's all about how we formulate our loving bonds and that part of that has to do with our relationship to self. And the other part is that with our loving relationships or what the relationships that we need love from, because yeah. it's very clear from the science, the attachment science that we really need connection. We just, we need it. We need to be in sync with each other emotionally. We need to be able to organize and plan together. We need to have someone's back and to have someone have our back. And as human beings, that's where we thrive the most. Yeah. There's something, so there's, there's so many pieces that you just kind of shared with us that I want to slow down and go back into if that's okay. Sure. One of the first parts is about having each other's back and and feeling also, I think like having our own back Mm -hmm. in the relationship. Um, that that is definitely a piece of security, but then I just want to kind of point out a few of these other things because you said, one of the things you said was that, if this is about how we create and maintain security inside of ourselves, which mm-hmm. definitely came before you started talking about how we don't, um, how we don't defend, how we don't block um, and react to the relationships that we're finding ourselves in. Yeah, that's right. Um, when we haven't had, um, when we don't have enough security, enough safety in relationships, we don't have our, I call it the ABCs of attachment that we need a, we need acceptance, mm-hmm. belonging, a place to belong. We need comforting when we get hurt, when we're afraid, we, and we need safety. So there's some basic things about being human that we really need to feel secure. Um, and since we're bonding mammals and we are born helpless, <laughs> we often develop that uh, initial security or insecurity from our caregivers. And then as we grow up, we can fortunately reflect upon ourselves if we take time to do that and get to know our inner world and start to be able to recognize when we block, when we push others away 
from our own defensiveness, you know, our strategies of protecting ourselves and our pain or trying to get our pain seen and heard that makes it difficult for people to come close to us or for us to maintain that connection. And so we can, we can discover that within ourselves uh, often through the help of reflective others who can give us feedback and that we can be in connection with. Right. Uh, So it's a circular process of me to you and you to me. (laughs) And that, that, it grows inside from having positive contact. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that my listeners will be familiar with. We've talked about it in other episodes. I'm thinking quickly of Resma Menachem, um, Heidi Schleifer, and Jen Bergstrom. Um, yeah. And so, so there's a lot of different pieces of of learning ourselves through kind of witnessing how we affect and how we're with others. That yes that reflective piece, but also this part about seeing um, within ourselves kind of what's missing and and what there is just to kind of sit in awareness of. Yeah. And it's so important, I think for, it's a hard thing to do, but for us to, you know, recognize our own from, from an EFT perspective. And I guess yeah. this fits very much with my own personal ideation about who we are as human beings in general, that, we're trying, we're really trying to kind of operate in the world in the best ways that we know how, and that we're worthy of love, that we're just because we're alive and born, you know, that we're worthy of safety and love and connection that we not only need it, but that we're worth having it. And we have to find those ways that we can claim that and that we can claim it in a way that brings others close to us because mm-hmm. we need it. And, and it's hard to feel worthy when you don't feel held by the people that matter to you. Yeah. And when you don't, and, and so I think this brings us back to kind of one of the things that we're here to talk about today, which are common relationship pitfalls. And yeah. when you don't feel held and you don't feel worthy in a relationship, I think that kind of sets us up to be talking about the ways that we end up getting in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. Because we're all going to have Um, unworthy spots or fears about our worthiness at times, right? And um, uh, places where we feel more insecure, Yeah, you know, uh, roles or duties or moments where, you know, we're forgetful. We just can't be full on all the time (laughs) in full awareness about ourselves or other people. So, and, and that's a lot to ask of any one human being to do that. So as we can step into those places that need help, need attention, need acceptance, uh, to be able to recognize that and um, offer that opportunity to others to love on us, then things get better. But when we feel sensitive and insecure, and then we automatically, without even thinking, will kind of guard up in some way, whether that's we go behind a wall or whether we get critical of others and, and it can kind of push them behind a wall, that um, that can really block us from having what we need the most. Yeah, I'm in total agreement with you. I find both personally and professionally that noticing when those walls come up and yeah. having the self-awareness around it to be able to own that and notice what our own work is to do around that, that is one of the the biggest learning edges. It is. It's a very, very hard thing to do. And and it's very helpful as we notice in relationships where the pain points are, (laughs) because we contribute to the pain often, not always. You know, I do want to be careful because um, sometimes we're really mistreated. We're really other people's pain comes at us in ways that create pain and victimize us and really, really hurt and traumatize us. And so um, around that spot, though, we can still um, get love and affection and attention and, and, and heal. Like I really believe in our ability as, as humans to grow, to grow in kindness, to grow in capacity, to, develop across our lifespan. So um, where whatever spot we're in in self-awareness that we can increase that, whatever pain that we've come from, we can work towards healing that and that we need others along that journey with us. Yeah. And, and that last bit that we need others along the journey with us, it's, I mean, my personal belief is that it's in our relationships that 
we cultivate those kind of safe, sacred spaces yeah. that allow us to see the edges, to see ourselves because of the patterns that start emerging and start showing up. Yes, absolutely. Those are just a beautiful opportunities. They feel like, you know, weights and pressures and, uh, and painful, but those are also on the other side of that beautiful opportunities to find our growing edge and to lean into having that healing and having the connection that we really need. Yeah. So if you were to um, start with a, with a couple that you haven't met with before and give them just kind of like a general piece of advice about what they can do to shore themselves and their relationships up, where would you begin? Well, so, you know, one of the things that as a therapist that I'm trying to do is to help have this kind of conversation about the importance of needing that we really need each other. And of course, if you have a couple in front of you, um, they're often life partners. They've chosen each other. They've chosen each other for good reasons. And I really honor that. And sometimes they lose trust in that, that choosing or the because the, the pain gets in the in the way yeah. of believing in their love and that choice, and their defenses and so, are up, and their defenses are up. Yeah. And we, when we're in pain, we often rewrite things. You know, we start to rethink things. So one of the things that I try to do initially is to hear their love story. Mm-hmm. And you know, with Valentine's coming up, I think paying attention to that. Like when we get in pain, we can discredit that love story. Like, oh, I didn't really know you or, you know, I was naive or I always make bad choices around relationships. We can start to kind of dismiss that there was something really unique and special that we felt seen in some way, heard, understood, precious to that person before we chose to make a life with them. And so revisiting that love story is something I like to do with couples. I want to know, I want to hear and help them become aware about what it was, what need did the other bring into their world that helped them choose each other? Was it that feeling of acceptance, a sense of belonging that they were uh, giving attention and comforting? Was it that they felt safe with them in a way that they hadn't felt with someone else in a long time? And bringing that, those feelings to life and really paying attention to that. Yeah, maybe some of these other things aren't happening. We can work towards that. But let's keep alive that, those places that brought us together. And um, because emotion has a lot to do with how we move in the world and what we're motivated towards and away from. And so we can actually pay attention to the things that open our heart and um, help us be more loving, more kind, more forgiving, more generous. And that starts to impact the relational dynamic. Yeah. And so when we're impacting that dynamic by moving towards it, by bringing our awareness towards the parts that feel good, instead of only remembering the parts that are painful or that cause discomfort or hurt or are the edges that we're that we're rubbing up against, yes. <laughs> then, then we're in a position to kind of lean in a little bit more. We're in a position to kind of be shored up by the stuff that also feels good. Yes, because the pain actually does have to be addressed. Yeah, but we. It's much easier to address the pain when there's some sense of a soft place to land, you know, yeah. or at least hope to have that soft place to land. Hope to have that. Find me in your eyes again. Have have that sense that you're looking across me and seeing me or hearing me that I used to feel a lot more before I felt like I needed to go to couple therapy and have that up and running. That's a kind of soft place to land. So we can go to the revisit the painful places and come out as a team. Right. And that that's the next piece. I think perhaps maybe is that um, this part about being a team, you've brought this up a few times so far mm-hmm. today. And I yeah. think that maybe this is another part that we need to dive into a little bit. Because as I see it, a lot of couples who show up in my office aren't really functioning like a team. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's true. We start to, one of the things that happens is we get hurt and we start to defend ourselves. And whether that defend ourselves is just to go behind the wall and ice the other per- person out and protect ourselves you know, from more heat of distress or it is to turn up the heat 
to try to get more attention, you know, whichever strategy we most generally use. Someone who's um, withdrawing, someone who's pursuing that kind of someone strategy is what you're drawing. Someone who's pursuing. That's uh-huh. right. That's what I'm referring to. It's like going behind the wall, icing out or turning up the heat that no matter what we're doing, it represents that we were in pain and that our vulnerability got hurt, got hit, you know, and that we felt alone. We felt alone. And then we armor up whichever way that we, whichever way we cope with that pain, we um, armor up. And so as that happens, there's a progression that this happens within relationships. We have some pretty good research around this. And the first thing couples do will say, we have a problem. We know we're having a hard time communicating. We have a problem. When they're not able to really recognize that it's the pain they need to address, not the content of the fight, not the planning, not the goal making, not the decision making, that it's the pain that needs to be addressed. Um, If they're unable to do that, they can't really see it or or don't know about, about how to do that. Then the next stage is to go from we have a problem. So it shifts from that team we to I have a problem or you have a problem. So that's the next level of progression in distress is to go from we have a problem. Let's try. Let's try to fix it. What are we doing to see there? You did that again. I've told you before. I didn't like that. Or there you go again. So I'm not going to talk to you about that because we already tried and that didn't work. Right. And so the distance creates more pain and more pain can create more distance. And so this whole negative loop that becomes self-feeding starts. starts. And I just want to kind of come back to that pain that really needs to be addressed by the we. Um, yeah. Because I think if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're suggesting is that at least a root of that pain or part of the root of that pain lies in the loneliness. Yes, that's right lies in the isolation and that sense of once we go from team, we have a problem to you. I I have a problem. We've created more loneliness. We've created more pain, more loneliness. And then we start to disconnect that we're a team creating that loneliness, that there's some, something in our process that's creating and expanding the loneliness rather than reducing the loneliness. Because if we if we own the part that we're a team, if we stay centered on that instead of the I or the you, yes. then we're already working towards a remedy. Absolutely, that's right. And so mm-hmm. this is one of the first things why I want what I do and try to keep up and running in my therapy room is that we how even though you're operating differently in a different different way of coping with the pain that that is increasing the pain and the loneliness. Yeah. And that's something that as a we you're doing together. Yes. I love it. Um, so how do you, I mean, so you have, I, I'll give yeah. you, maybe it helps if I give an example, I don't know, we're talking really theoretically. So I can think of a couple and as a very common, you've talked about the pursue withdraw pattern. So it's very common, right? The, um, the pursuer will bring up the complaint. Ah, you hurt me. You hurt me. You know, and the withdrawer goes, but I didn't do anything. <laughs> how could that hurt you? Right? I, I don't know how not doing anything could hurt you. Right? And the pursuers, but you don't understand me. Right? You're leaving me alone. I I want to understand I, what about me don't you understand? And they protest, right? And so that's a place where people really get stuck in that uh, defensive response, where one partner says. I don't, I can't claim that I did anything. I certainly didn't have any intention to hurt you. And so when we start to disconnect as a team, we um, lose confidence in each other's positive intention. And that increases the sense of isolation or we lose confidence in our own because I'm now lashing out at you and I'm behaving towards you in a way I didn't ever imagine that I would what's the matter with me? So we can turn it either on our partner or on ourselves, but um, that I'm not trying to do anything. And that we lose that goodness of our love of the goodness of our loving bond and um, lose that confidence in the midst of the pain. Yeah. yeah. It's so interesting. I'm, I'm listening to you 
talk about this with an EFT lens through through like an EFT way of looking at the science of love. Yes, and totally. um, I'm pretty immersed in like an RLT, uh, Terry Real Pia Melody kind of model. And yet yeah. I'm hearing all the same kind of root of everything. We're, we're talking about um, when we either feel um, some kind of contemptuous feeling towards the other or towards ourselves. We're talking about the, the pursuit mm-hmm. and the withdrawal is, is very much the walled off or the boundaryless. It's, it's yeah. all relationally kind of interwoven and we have all of these different lenses to see it in. But yes, what, totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What we're talking about is so familiar. Yeah, good. I'm so glad. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, so from the emotionally focused therapy standpoint and view, the common thread here are, you know, what we, because it's the pursue withdraw pattern is like one of the best known patterns yes. before there was even therapy to treat it. It was recognized um, among psychologists in the field when people were coming back from the first world war and, and psychology was just kind of um, at its roots, just, just being born, we could identify that pursue withdraw pattern. What we didn't really understand uh, many times is it comes right back to self. Like, you know, we need to do more on our own. And I think what's pretty unique and maybe not totally unique because the bonding science and the love science is getting pretty universally recognized was that it's because of the need for each other and that attachment and that love, that that's the thread, you know, that's the important thread that we need to really pay attention to is how do we block and how do we, you know, defend or block each other in a way that creates that, increases that pain and that isolation. Because those kinds of, the the ways that we defend or the ways that we block, they're going to happen every day in every relationship. We're not going to get past them. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Because they're unconsciously set up. We're, it's actually a beautiful part about our neurology is um, that ends up working against us sometimes is that in certain situations to cope with pain, like we need to cope with pain. We need to be able to survive through some situations, relationship dynamics, especially from when we're young, to keep our attachment figures, those stronger, wiser others who are there to help take care of us, to keep them close. And so we adapt to cope in ways that uh, less offend our our caretaking, our take our caretakers. And so our brain is actually made to speed up the way that we cope with pain and to attune more quickly to the threats so that we can walk more safely in the world. And so that works great when we're not in a reciprocal relationship, like a parent-child relationship where we don't, we're really not the caregiver. We're not supposed to be, um, you know, the one that's watching out Mm -hmm. for safety. That's not our job as children. Um, But we learn some ways that we kind of have to cope with what's um, happening in our environment that we take on some of that because, uh, you know, it's part of being human and growing up. And then our brain actually finds the threat and accentuates the threat so that we can more quickly cope and jump on our feet faster. And then when that happens and it starts to happen in our relationships where we're coping in the ways that actually helped us thrive, where the last relationships where we came from or our growing up relationships, it's not so productive anymore Right. Um, in an adult reciprocal relationship. I find that all the time in my work. Um, you know, in, in Terry Reel's language, uh, it's almost like there's two adaptive children in the room. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Both people coping the best they have, their brains on alert and moving into these coping defenses that were perfectly productive when they were in their childhood, (laughs) they needed them in in many ways to, to survive whatever it was that they were working through. And now in these adult relationships, they're the very things that may be getting in the way. See it all the time. Yeah. So um, I find that, that helping couples to see that pattern is kind of the starting point. Um, I wonder if there's any advice that you have for couples who might be listening, who are thinking, um, I think I know what that pattern is already, or I'm getting a, you know, like, 
where would yes. you, where would you take them next? So we often have some sort of awareness, like I'm keep trying to get through and you don't listen to me or I feel attacked and criticized all the time. So we'll have, we have awareness of um, the ways that we cope because those are visible. They're, it's yeah. seen, you know, we're experiencing it. What we often don't know about sometimes about ourselves and lots of times about our sweetheart is their the catastrophic fear that drives the coping. Right. Mm -hmm. So there, because the fight flight response is driven is by in, something driven by the fear, the pain, the, uh, the, the fear that I'm going to be left alone and lonely. I'm in pain now and I'm always going to be here. I'm rejected. Now I'm going to keep being rejected. I better armor up. So and it always so, seems to go back to that loneliness because the mm -hmm. other side of that loneliness would be that I can be with you. I'm, I'm in I the way connected to you. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Right. And so getting down to that, because it's made to be unconscious and fast, mm -hmm. because if I can just feel the jolt of, uh Oh, danger, you're going to reject me here. Oh, I see you. And you've got that little angry look on your eye or you're turning away. And I see that disapproval. And my brain says, quick, you know, like, I don't even have to think about it. I'm an automatic. That trigger has me coping. And so there's this gap between the trigger and that hits the pain. You know, I can see you doing that says I'm going to be more alone and lonely. And then the coping response that becomes a feedback loop. So there's that often unaware. I'm aware of what I'm doing. I'm pretty aware of what my partner's doing. But the why of that, yeah. the, the, the pain that they're hiding through the coping mechanism, I, don't, I can't see that. And it's often hard to believe that I'm hurting you in the way that would have you respond to me that way. Right. You know, as, as you're talking, I'm thinking of um, one of Viktor Frankl's quotes. That um, between the mm -hmm. stimulus and the response, there's a space, Yes, you know, and in that there's space, space, yeah, there's a space. And in that space lies our power and our freedom to choose our, our response. Yeah, our the freedom to choose. And it's the, yeah. like the golden um, place where we can really see each other and really get reconnected and yeah. have, you know, this kind of golden light of soothing come in and join us again. Yeah. But we have to slow down to find that space. We really and have to create slow enough down. safety that we can. Safety, like enough courage, enough safety that, whoa, if I see that I've really actually been criticizing you and that's painful to you, I'm going to feel bad about me hurting you because you are the person I love. And it takes some courage to own that and, and also kind of give ourselves compassion or our sweethearts compassion for that our brain doing what it's meant to do what about trying to be self-protective that actually caused us more hurt. Oh, I love the way that you put that because it, it already, it's a framework of, of how to, to start going into that space of giving ourselves and our sweeties more compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, it's, we need, we really, and, and it's hard to, especially if we didn't, haven't been on the receiving yeah. end of much compassion mm -hmm. or much empathy. It reminds me a lot of, of the work around mirror neurons and the development of empathy. So I'm thinking of uh, Marco Icaboni and his work around discovering mirror neurons because, uh, and he has a fabulous book written for the lay population about it. When they, when they discovered mirror neurons looking inside the brain, he, he said I didn't, he didn't really know where to look to begin with. They thought social and the social part of yep. the brain made sense. Um, but when they found the mirror neurons, what happened was they looked just like every other neuron until they received empathy. And then they, sh they shifted, it they transposed, they transformed into mirror neurons. <laughs> So if we haven't had a lot of empathy or compassion, being able to give that to ourselves or others is really difficult because we it's not highly developed in our own system to do it's it. It's not but turned on. It's not turned on. That little that little neuro uh, 
that that didn't shift yet. It didn't turn on. It didn't potentiate into um, a mirror neuron, which says, oh, I can understand you and I can understand me and I can give empathy and compassion to that. So it's tricky. It's why we can't really do it alone. Right. <laughs> why we need each other in order to why be able to really other. learn yeah. this, this state of kind of re-regulation and, and That's right. discovery of empathy and, and growing into that. Yeah. Now, one other thing that I love about Marco's work, Dr. Kabani's work, is that he um, found, and he continues, he's at UCLA, he continues to study this in his lab, that these, um, these mirror neurons, these neurons, before they're mirror neurons, like he says, I, have n- I, I, can't, ima- I can't even begin to imagine all like they're everywhere. So they're finding these uh, neurons turning into mirror neurons, every part of the brain, not just in the social part, every part of the brain. And he says he thinks it's unlimited. He, he actually believes that every neuron might be able to, well, maybe not everyone, but it's like uncountable number of neurons can potentiate into mirror neurons. So we can just continue to develop more ability to be close and be connected and have empathy, right? Because empathy is that shared joined space where you see me and I see you and we can feel together. Even if we feel differently about something, we can have compassion for that. And so that that can be unlimited. Well, and we can just keep growing in that the more connection that we have the more of those neurons uh, potentiate. That's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. It's really helpful. You know, one of the things that you're saying in there is that if the definition you just gave of empathy, um, you see me, I see you, we can feel together. Even if we don't agree with each other, we can feel together. And I find that this is such, such the learning edge for so many couples is that, you know, I don't have to agree with you. It's not about my truth or your truth. It's about understanding. It's about getting to that place where we can tolerate the discomfort that comes with seeing the world differently. Yes, we can tolerate it. And then from that joint space, we can actually come up with some pretty interesting brainstorming, problem solving, creative, like it's a creative space. Once we're there and connected and then we go, well, I think differently about this and I feel differently about that. But we're a team, so you because know, we're not blocked we're anymore. Satisfy both. We're not blocked, and then yeah. this cre- this beautiful creativity opens up. Yeah, yeah, that's that's just such a great way to put it. I love that. I've I've often heard either Sue or you or maybe both of you talk about um, you know dancing as a metaphor in relationships and how mm-hmm. um, toes are going to be stepped on. Do you want to mm-hmm. kind of share a little bit more around that? Because I just love that. <laughs> Yeah, so we're partners on a dance floor, you know, trying to work work away around life and that it's really impossible to dance in close proximity and not every once in a while to step on each other's toes, even though you don't mean to, you know, somebody from the sideline waves at us or I get tired or I'm hungry or I just get out of step or it's not my music, you know. And so there's ways that we can um, get out of touch or or hurt each other without Mm -hmm. intending to, but it even if we don't intend to, it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Right. <laughs> and sometimes we get defensive around because I didn't mean to hurt you. And then I feel bad. I feel ashamed. I, it hurts me that I hurt you because I want to see myself as taking care of you. And it actually can become a block, right? The not meaning to and doing it when we don't mean to can become a block to recovery, to healing, to, to having, being compassionate. Um, and lots of couples get stuck there, right? Yeah. So with that, I didn't mean to. And you should know that I didn't mean to. And if you knew I didn't mean to, you wouldn't hurt so much. Which in, in some ways, it's kind of true. If I can hold on that you didn't mean to, it's not going to take all the hurt away, but at least I'm not going to feel quite as defended and lonely. I still mean need to say, but it does hurt. So can you come kiss my owie? Right? <laughs> Which is different than going, wow, you stepped on me. <laughs> right. It's a totally different response. It, it, it's a, and, and because you're, you're showing up in a different way, you're softening um, yeah. that, that invites a different response in return. Yes, that's right. It invites a different, uh, it, it's an openness to say, 
I still see you yeah. and you hurt me. And I know, I know your heart that you didn't mean to. And so you are the one that I need to help heal my hurt because yeah. you're the most important one to see my pain and to help me repair it. Yeah. And, and that's right there that as you described that you're the one to help me heal this, that's the reconnection point. That's the reconnection point as yeah. a, when we can respond to it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's also, I mean, this is the place where either partner has the ability to own that. That's right. Both partners can come in around that and we can be the hurt one and invite the healing in. Mm -hmm. We can be the one that created the hurt and, and, you know, offer the healing. Yeah. And it's best when I offer and you receive, or, you know, I ask and you respond. Right. Either way, it doesn't really matter. You know, but whoever has the first awareness, then it kind of uh, can become our responsibility to accept, to change, to work on that change. I love that. Now, here's here's an interesting little um, pitfall that I've seen um, in some couples is that maybe they've developed an awareness or a particular partner has developed an awareness around that need. And then they start noticing that they're always the one to initiate um, yeah. the recovery. Yeah, it can be a sticking place, right? Mm -hmm. Now I feel like it's a burden on me that I'm carrying alone because I'm the one that has to bring it up all the time. Yeah. And so now we're right of, back at loneliness. Now we're right back alone. <laughs> That's right. And it's just looped right around all of a sudden because you're not helping yeah. me share this burden of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so that is part of that cycle and recognizing that cycle and the fear like, oh, if if I do that, that you will never, never be one that lets me in, that it won't be reciprocal, that you won't let me in when I hurt you. Maybe maybe you're not bringing up when I hurt you. Right. Um, or maybe you're not bringing up when you think you hurt me, you know. So it's it, there's some awareness that we can go around that. What blocks, you know, what, what are the blocks of kind of owning if we hurt somebody? What's the blocks of apologizing? You know, what, what are the blocks around, what are the fears that come up and block and cre really create that loop again? Like, okay, I'm, I'm the only one bringing up. And oftentimes what happens is that we do have different strengths and mm -hmm. different awarenesses. And so uh, it's like, well, I take out the trash and you do the dishes, but I'm the one that always takes out the trash. You know, I'm the only one that does this. <laughs> <laughs> and, right. and then I forget that, oh yeah, but I don't actually do the dishes, right? I'm talking about a surface level kind of thing, but yeah. maybe I'm really good because my sensitivities have me cope by being more aware of pain and sensitivities. And I get this bigger emotional alarm. And so I'm actually, I feel pain more because of that I accept emotion easier. I like my emotion. I want to share my emotion. So, of course, why wouldn't I be the one that notices that first? Right. right? And that's a strength. And so suddenly I, I feel like uh, maybe maybe now that's a burden to me or it's a burden to you. Somehow I'm left alone because I've it, it, like there is room for us to have different strengths. And sometimes we isolate ourselves by not recognizing each other's strengths and are expecting that we're going to be the same. Yeah. This kind of quest for um, almost assimilation or sameness is, yeah. is part of this because it's that edge where loneliness is also existing. If you're not just like me, yeah. then I already feel alone instead of being able to somehow um, pair with you and manage yeah, it's really a symptom of not having enough connection. Yeah. Right. It's a, uh, because if we don't have enough connection, then I'm going to be more sensitive around the places that I feel alone. And those yeah. are going to be amplified because I'm not getting enough soothing or attention or recognition for my unique contributions. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't give myself enough credit as well. Then um, because I have some pain around that, then it's easy to be sensitive, right? The more that we can recognize each other's strengths and more we have connection, the easier it is to accept those differences. So, so one of these, these big pitfalls, I mean, if we really were to take what we're talking about today and consolidate it a little bit, 
I'm, I'm taking away that if we can recognize these edges where we feel alone and take responsibility for how we invite reconnection in those moments or respond to opportunities to reconnect, yeah. that, that that might be one of the biggest things we can do for our relationships. Yes, totally. That, that is opens lots of doors <clears throat> there yeah. into connection. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other like big ones that you want to, any other big pitfalls that you want to make sure we address? Um, well, the other one that comes to mind, and this probably has something to do with Valentine's Day, I don't know, because of romance is in the yeah. air. Around all of this. <laughs> the other one that comes to mind is, um, well, there's kind of two, an A and B part to this. Part A is that the more, um, the more distress there is in our love relationship, the more sex becomes important and adds into the distress for most couples. Happy couples, you know, sex is like a cherry on top, the top, right? So if I can have connection, I have those more connection needs met. I'm not so lonely. There's not so much pain. Then it's great. You know, it will all, most couples will say, about 20%, 10 or 20%, a small part of the relationship um, has to do with our sex life, right? As distress, as loneliness and distress increases, then we start to assign more and more to that romantic element, up to 70 or 80% of importance to it. And so then we get lost in the weeds. Like we forget it's actually about, you know, that space that we're connecting around. Yeah. So I think that's important to for us to remember because it can be a distraction from the real thing, which is getting our hearts connected. So much. I'm, and my, my mind is kind of twirling around that. Is it okay if I kind of just let sure. you know what I'm thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because there's so much, there's so much here. I'm seeing sex both as a drive towards connection, right? Yes. Like quite literally. Absolutely. And and energetically, um, the sex, the erotic, the eros, it's about that life, that creative energy that we were just talking about before when we start yeah. turning on all those mirror neurons. We're able to get to the point of kind of problem solving and thinking more creatively, but that's also, that could also be sexual energy. That's that's that eros. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Can be. And so uh, it when we're not getting connected, then yeah. that becomes extra problematic, right? right? And when we are connected, we're, f- we're feeding into that energy in multiple ways. And so sex isn't, doesn't have it's to not, be the thing. That's right. Exactly. It doesn't yeah. have to be the thing. We have lots more channels for it and we're feeling, and we can actually problem solve around it if it's a problem, you know, or you don't feel like it tonight. And I do, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't right. mean rejection or abandonment. It doesn't leave me alone. I can go, Oh, I was so looking forward to it. And you go, I know, how about tomorrow, right? And it's not like I'm alone all of a sudden. Right. <laughs> but if I, if we can't quite do that, then that that It becomes an insult, another, another becomes injury, an another in- aloneness. Yes. yes. Right. Oh, this yeah. is, I, I see how everything is kind of spiraling in similar directions here which is really exciting, you know, that, that on one hand you have aloneness and on the other hand you have connection. And then in between, there's all of these different components that um, are perpetuating the aloneness or getting in the way of the connection right. or enhancing the connection and decreasing the aloneness. And that somehow it's that aloneness that creates the suffering. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> and, and we just need to keep that in mind because these other things can be really big distractions. Yes. And, yeah. and, and that there's a piece of this that is the, is the we, is what's happening with us. But then there's another piece of this that's what's happening inside of me and how, yeah. I'm, how I'm contributing to it. And that's, yes. you know, that's the part that we'll always have control over. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's the part we have control over. That's the part that we need help with. That's the part that we can start to make an uh, inroad on, make a response differences let our 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 intentions be known you know slow ourselves down apologize recognize our recognize our part and yeah. one person can do a lot to to start to change those gaps right? yeah yeah one more thing i'd love to just chat with you about because i feel like this is an important one in terms of 
always find being able to find the reconnection points. And that's just about apology. I find yeah. that that is such an important and probably the most romantic thing that couples can learn how to do well, yes. um, how to both receive it and how to offer it. So I'm wondering if you want to, to share anything about that. Well, my mind goes to um, Thich Nhat Hanh's Four Mantras of Love. I don't know if you know them, I'm but not familiar, um, no. so the first one, uh, and it goes from easiest to hardest, right? The more to more in depth. And the first one is to, uh, and it, it ties into apology. I think you'll see as we get there. Yeah. The first one is, darling, I'm here for you. You look into their eyes and you say it with your full intention that when you love someone, the best thing that we can offer them is our true presence. Yeah. And the second one is, um, darling, I know you are there. So right, it's keeping in mind that good intention of our sweetheart. And I know you're there and I'm happy because I know you're there. So we're recognizing the presence of having a loved one with us in our life that brings us so we can embrace them with that, with that caring, with that mindfulness. And then the third one is when we start to introduce the pain, um, Darling, I know you suffer, and that is why I'm here for you. So we begin to acknowledge our sweetheart's suffering, the pain, and that our presence brings immediate relief if we can be there. That way. Yeah. And then the final one is, um, darling, I suffer. I'm trying my best to practice. Please help me. Mm-hmm. So when we're hurting and it's most difficult when we're suffering and we believe that our suffering is caused by our sweetheart. (laughs) And sometimes we just want to isolate ourselves from them or lash out back. But if we can bring ourselves to share um, in that moment and say and share that with our sweetheart, I'm suffer, I suffer and help me. that that opens immediately uh, an, a possibility to have that connection to where our loved one can say, I'm sorry you suffer and I'm, and I'm sorry if I caused your suffering. Yeah. Because yeah. it's really the disconnection that causes the suffering, not either one of us per se. Not anything. I mean, it, it could be that there are things that we've done, but it's the fact that those Absolutely. in there we're getting lost and what we're not seeing is the disconnect. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, of course, we're doing things that step on each other's toes all mm-hmm. the time, right? Yeah. So there, but at the deeper level, there's the surface level, you know, you stepped mm-hmm. on my toe and the deeper level, like, you stepped on my toe because you disregarded me or because I'm not important or, you know, because you're um, not so careful. Like you don't really care about me. Right? And sometimes I find that those are stories that we're making up based on old um insecure attachments, the, the way yes, the stories right. that we've made up about how we survived in the world. Yeah, that's right. And, and they're, they're now playing out in our adult right. relationships. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I am. Um, I feel called to share one little piece with you before we close out today. And that's okay. uh, one of my teachers is Dr. Clarissa Pincola Estes. And in her, one of her groundbreaking books, women who run with the wolves, she has this one little part in there where she talks about the etymology of the word alone which yeah. formerly meant all one. Yes. And I just, I, I'm being drawn back to kind yeah. of that, well, that teaching as we're talking yeah. about this aloneness being the suffering and the pain and how it's really that kind of coming back to that state of oneness. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. And she's remarkable, by the way. I <laughs> love her. And I've got to sit down with her a few times and she's, you know, she has a great, people can read her, right? Yes. She's, great, great T- presence tons. on Facebook. You can find her yeah. um, and be touched by her and moved by her. It's fantastic work that she does. Yes. Yeah. All one. All Let's one. get back to being all one. Yeah. 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 That's the work. Becca, thank you so much for joining us here today. Where can our listeners find you if they want to learn more? Uh, so my website, Dr. Rebecca Jorgensen, Dr. Rebecca Jorgensen. And then you can find me either at Dr. Becca J on social um, or EFT doc, I guess. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm going to make sure to put all those links in our show notes so that folks can just click on them too. Okay, um, great. And thank you for coming and joining us. Thank really you. Thank you for the, the work you're doing and the, you know, the all oneness that you're promoting and supporting. It makes the world different when we can see our connection and our value to each other. Yeah. And one of my past guests, Heidi Schleifer, talked about um, the tipping point that if we can get like 5% of couples to kind of get this, that we can yeah, generate right. a movement. <laughs> and I really love that idea. So I think we're all in it we together. Get five couples. Yeah, we get yeah. five couples who can also tell five other couples. And, you know, because actually loving couples can encourage discouraged couples and and help them know what made a difference to them. We all yeah. have the power to change the world that way. Yeah, we do. Thank yeah. you. Thank okay, you for thank your work. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Learn more about my Connectfulness Counseling practice, the intensives that I offer, and my collective for therapists and private practice over at connectfulness.com. And listeners often ask how they can support the ongoing production of the Connectfulness Practice Podcast. Truly the best way is that you can simply subscribe and rate the show on your favorite podcasting platform, and then hop on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. This episode is brought to you by Therapy Notes, a simple, secure EHR platform that keeps you organized and creates a container for all the details that run a private practice. Use the promo code CONNECTFULNESS and get two months free when you sign up at therapynotes.com. I want to express my deep gratitude to Sarah and Chris Farris, the musicians behind the beautiful soundtrack for the Connectfulness Practice podcast, which was recorded and mixed at Kidney Stone Studio. This podcast is produced by me, Rebecca Wong, and copyrighted by Connectfulness Counseling.